Thanks so much for joining us, Kenny. Uh, if you can, give me a little uh, background about where you grew up and what, you know, what your childhood was all about a little bit. Okay, well, I grew up in Chicago, uh, the Windy City. Um, I grew up in a Hispanic neighborhood, a lower income area, and it was gang infested. You know, everybody knows what Chicago is. It hasn't changed. Um, and growing up there, I had my, my mother and my father. I had two sisters. And, and, you know, we grew up poor, but we didn't know we were poor because everybody around us had the same thing. Right, <laughs> right. Okay, did you join a gang? Eventually. Eventually okay. I did. Kind of sucked you in a little bit? <clears throat> well, you know, you live in the neighborhood. You grow up. You're friends. You know, you become part of the neighborhood, and, and that, that ends up happening. Um, it's not something that I wanted to. I actually joined kind of against what I, what I was doing. You can get forced in. Right. Um, and I got a force in is what happened. Did you have role models growing up? What was your family structure like? I did. Um, my father worked with gangs, actually, <laughs> to okay. try and help get people out of gangs. But it put him on the street a lot, so he was, he was not home a lot. You know, uh, mom was working and going to college at the same time. You know, so these, there was a lot of distractions. And, and we were free to roam outside. So, you know, you get boys outside, we're going to do mischievous things. Things happen, right? <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> okay. So fast forward years later, you moved to South Florida. I actually met yes. you a few years ago. Uh, when did you settle down uh, down in uh, this well, area? Well, I moved to Florida um, after it was discovered by my family that I was starting to get involved with gangs. And uh, I, at one point, my father sat across from me. And my father's a very built dude, and he tells me, I'll V you out. Right. <laughs> and so I was pretty terrified. But my mom, you know, she said, look, I'm not going to lose my kids to the street. It was a very bitter divorce. And, my, you know, so we... we uprooted and we moved to Florida in uh, about nine, 1994. Okay, okay. Now fast forward again because as you know the, the common thread is really about the common thread of success, the common thread of overcoming uh, adversity and I know that you had a tremendous amount of adversity and I really want to hear about that and I think that the, really the takeaway is it's not just the adversity that you've had, it's really how you got through it because you were really up against it. Now, I know that you were arrested, you're actually looking at close to life Yes. in prison uh crazy so so tell me a little <clears throat> bit about what happened and uh i'm gonna ask you some questions because you're a great role model for helping others you know get through their difficult times as well too well um it was it was a, a traumatic time in my life um i was celebrating my birthday and uh we went out to a nightclub <clears throat> and while we were at the nightclub the officer that was on duty that night was having a problem with one of the patrons in the bar and he told them to leave, at which point they did leave, but he thought I was that person when I came back to pay my tab. So he then kicked me out, and um, the person that he did kick out ended up spitting on his car. So as I walked outside, the, the security outside or the valet had made a phone call inside and said, hey, this guy just spit on your car. Mm -hmm. Well, this officer, he just lost it at that point, came out and attacked me. And, uh, you know, with, with the big melee that ensued with my family trying to pull him out, the people that he was having problems with, jumping in, I ended up... Now, now was this an off-duty police officer? He was off-duty. It was like moonlighting. Okay. He was yeah. moonlighting almost as a bouncer in the bar. Yes, but he was in full Hollywood police gear. Okay. And so um, he ended up... He, he, they arrested us, they, and they charged me with attempted murder and, and a slew of other charges. Okay, so this was a little bit of this uh, dispute, somebody... Spit on yes. somebody's car, a little bit of an argument. Was there any weapons involved? With, you know, how did it elevate well, to attempted murder on a police officer? <laughs> We're still trying to figure that one out. Okay. Um, well, what happened was um, when he hit me, he kind of like knocked me silly. So I, I didn't. I remember getting hit, and then I remember hearing the sound of a police car, which actually of a car, of a body falling on a car, which was mine. But I was, you know, you ever get hit so hard, you get that white flash, and sure. you're not exactly, that's what happened. So I felt his hand on my throat, I felt my body go down to the car, and at that point, um, one of my friends, who is like a brother to me, he jumped on his back and pulled his arms and stopped him from hitting me because he was just kept hitting me. And okay. so um, another officer <clears throat> went over there and tried to grab him, and when my sister went to to move him off of um, Edwin, then another officer came and hit my sister, at which time her husband, who had just pulled up the car, he sees some guy in black hit his wife. <laughs> he jumps out. Okay. And this ended up, it ended up be, uh, being a big fight. And other people that were involved, that were, that were actually part of the problem of a group of people that he was having problems with earlier, decided to all get in and get their free hits in. In the meantime, I'm pinned between the car with one of my friends, and when I popped up, the officer fired two weapon, two shots at me. 
Okay, so so at the end of the day, you, you kind of were at a bar, a yes. nightclub, nightclub. A yeah. fight ensued. There was yeah. a police officer involved. Now all of a sudden, you find yourself charged with attempted murder of a police officer, yes. and basically it was a barroom brawl. Yes. So, yeah. I, I wouldn't. I, you know what? I wouldn't go so far as to call it a bar, barroom brawl because okay. we were trying to leave, and and he had he basically got the wrong person. Okay. And and he attacked the wrong person and. You know, no one really knew he was an officer because of his uniform was all black. Their uniforms are all black. We're not used to seeing that. So he looked like a bouncer. Okay. You know, I was the only one who was aware of that he was an officer, and, and I ended up calling 911 after I was able to stand up. Okay, so here's, here's an important question for you, and this is what happens to people sometimes. You know, they, life isn't always fair, and it, you know, it sounds like what happened, you know, mistakes were made, but to get charged with attempted murder of a police officer, how many years were you looking at? For 32 jail? years. So you were gonna have 32 years in jail. Yes. So what, 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 what was the first thing you thought of? I mean, emotionally, what happened to you? I was devastated. When I first heard my charges, I, I, when the lady said my charges to me, I said, are, are you sure you're talking about the right person? And she said, yeah, you're never going home. And, and I said, well, what are all my charges? And she listed all the charges which was attempted murder on officer, law enforcement officer, battery on law enforcement officer, depriving an officer of his means to protect himself. Um, I don't remember the other one. So there was a there slew. There was a slew of charges. A slew just, of charges. <laughs> yeah. And were, were you in denial? What, did you, I, well, did we, you think it was hopeless? I mean, what were you really feeling at that point? Because a lot of people, you know, you had your circumstance and your situation. Sometimes people may get a bad you know, uh, report as far as health or relationship, and where all of a sudden your world is completely turned upside down. Now, I know you came out of this thing yeah. really well, and that's why I want to talk to you, but what was really your immediate emotion? What were you really feeling when this whole thing was happening? Horror, fear and horror, and and I, I was terrified. I was, I, I everything that, Everything about life to me was now looked like it was going to end. Right. You know, my freedom was going to be gone, and I'm going to be stuck in a cage with a bunch of other real criminals. <laughs> you know, and don't consider myself one. Right. <laughs> Never did, and at that point, now I'm going to be stuck with them. So, so here's <clears throat> a question for you, and I know you gave me this answer before, and I just loved it. You know, what got you through each day? I know you spoke about the future. Yes. But, you know, what, what kind of got you through each day? You're looking at 32 years in jail. You know, we're going to get into how you, you actually didn't really have an attorney to begin with and how, we, oh, how, yeah. how you got that. But you're really looking at it. What was your mindset? What is your mindset that you would suggest or you would uh, ask others to have in order to get through such a difficult time? Well, the first thing, the, the first thing for me is, is my faith. It's is, is my faith. You know, um, and I went to God and I prayed a lot. And I wasn't at the time that I arrest when I was arrested. I wasn't a very big man of faith. I didn't really, didn't really matter to me, mm -hmm. nonetheless, um, whether or not it was real or not. And so at that point, my father, who was a pastor, and I remember when I was actually one of the first couple of weeks in jail. Excuse me. I said, um, God, you know, my father works for you, right. <laughs> and this is how. This is where I end up. Right. You know, and it's funny, but that's where my mindset was. So you, so you, you, you went, you, you, you know, obviously the faith. Yes, exploded. faith was big. But, but okay. another part of it is family and mm -hmm. friends. I had a lot of family, a lot of friends. And I was able to, to use, utilize them through, through conversation. Um, having good times together is really, you got to try and live. Because you, you want to shell up. You know, you want to go into a shell when you feel like you feel like you're alone. You feel like everybody's looking at you like you're this horrible person. You feel like the hope is dwindling. You're losing it. And you just want to shell up. And, and I would say don't ever do that. So, because... so you can't kind of crawl into a ball and then dig a hole and jump in it. You need to look at your resources, look at the people around you Reach and, out. And, and gather them around you. You also told me something about planning for the future, which I thought was very insightful. You were actually, while your world is, you know, falling down, you were thinking about, boy, I want to get a house and I yes. want to rebuild. I want to do, so talk to me about that a little, about actually painting a bright future for yourself, even in the midst of such duress. Well, I, I, I ended up um, having my wife. <clears throat> she was my girlfriend at the time. I had the ring. And uh, my plan was to propose to her, but at a certain date, but, you know, I was locked up for that date. <laughs> but when I got out, um, I talked to her about starting a family and 
and we ended up finding out she was pregnant and I told her, I said, listen, I already have the ring, so let's do this. Let's go because we're going we're gonna to start a future together. And so my goal was to keep, to, to keep hope alive, to keep the pressure off myself. I, I focused on making plans. I planned with her to buy a house. I planned on what cars we were going to buy and what colors we were going to paint the house and the interior and what kind of TV we were going to just, we planned for the future, future jobs or, or things that we wanted to start businesses. You know, we plan for the and future. And that, that sounds great. But I, I guess the challenge that I see with people is when, when there's a storm coming at them and their world falls apart, they're concentrating on each minute, each day, and each hour to survive. And I guess the really takeaway that you're trying to share with us is, hey, you, you can't just, you know, suck yourself into, into the terrible situation that you're in. You kind of got a vision a good yes. a good future for yourself. You have to see that the outcome is going to be is going to be positive. You have to believe it and you have to live that way. And and people will see that in you. And and I think that that was part of part of what people saw in the in the courtroom and you know, they saw our family the strength. They saw how we planned. We didn't we didn't plan to to go to jail. We planned to be free. Right. And we worked that way. And, and you think that it. mindset transferred Absolutely. Within the, within. Now, you also mentioned that you had friends and family. We're not all that fortunate. Not everybody's that fortunate. Some of us don't have friends and family. What happens if somebody's kind of in an island by themselves and they're really up against it? And again, it could be <clears throat> family, health, divorce. It doesn't matter whatever that adversity is. What happens if you don't have anybody to really lean on? Well, the beautiful thing about America is that there are the churches of every denomination throughout everywhere. And I would tell people, you know what, go to your nearest church. Reach out to the church, reach out to the community, to them, because they're there for the community. And that's, that's why they're there. You know, so it, no matter where you go, go and find yourself a home, a church-based home, and say, you know what, I, I, I need some help here. Because they're, those people will come out, no matter what it is, they're going to come help you. They're so gonna there's always somebody you. out there that there's always somebody. wants to help. And keeping the faith... Is important. Even when things are hopeless, is yes. very important. Now, you were, let's set the table here. You're up against the United States government, <laughs> yeah. right? With the, with the best attorneys, <clears throat> you're assaulting or attempted murder on a police officer. Yes. You're really up against it, okay? Yeah. Now, you had to go get a lawyer. I can, <laughs> talk about being resourceful. <laughs> when I work with my clients, whatever, I say, let's be resourceful. I love your story about how you were resourceful. You needed a, 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 an initial $30,000, right? Yes, yes. Well, what, what did it, you have a 30000 <laughs> No. How did you get it? <laughs> well, first of all, they, the first thing the family thought was we were, gonna, we were thinking about getting a public defender, which <clears throat> in, in, in jail they call them public pretenders okay. because they don't care. So that's why you have to get an attorney. So when we found out the price of the attorney, it automatically turned in, okay, to what, to we, what can we sell? You know what I mean? But that wasn't going to be sufficient. So we came up with an alternative plan. At the time, before Facebook was popular, it was MySpace. I went on MySpace and I created um, a defense fund. And I, my goal was to ask 30,000 people for a dollar so that I can have the money for the attorney. And it worked. It worked. <laughs> so you were one of the original innovators yes. back in MySpace <laughs> yeah. to really like crowd, it was crowdfunding. Yeah, it I was. Early it was. I had money ma being mailed into me. It was just a right. dollar. So. so in other words, again, you know, a lot of people wouldn't, and this is why I have this respect for you as well, a lot of people would be embarrassed. Even though they weren't, for example, weren't guilty, they'd still be embarrassed to tell people their story. You had to get out of your comfort zone. But yes, at the end of the absolutely. day, it helped you raise money. It helped you uh, create a bright future for yourself. So how important is it for people to get out of their comfort zone, you know, when they're having such a, you know, difficult time? You, you have to. You have no choice. Because it's either that or you're going to sink. And it's just like anything, if you want it bad enough, you're going to go get it. You're going to find a way. And I wanted the lawyers bad enough because I wanted my freedom bad enough. And so I had to go out there. And yes, it was embarrassing. It was humiliating. Because here I am coming from, you know, running a, a plumbing outfit, having 66 employees under me, to all of a sudden having to bust tables at a penny arcade. But I still managed. I still worked. I still managed. And I had to make it happen. So I had to humiliate myself. I had to go and tell people, listen, I know it sounds bad, but this is what I'm charged with. I need your help. Just a dollar. Just a dollar. Send me a dollar. And, and I'm telling you it's going great. And so it, it did. And I was able to accomplish that. Very resourceful. Very resourceful. <clears throat> uh, also, you had told me before about, you know, again, looking, and I can't stress enough, you're looking at 32 years in jail. Now, all of a sudden, they come to you and they say, okay, you don't have to go to jail. <laughs> but you have to do three years of probation. 
That was what happened. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. <laughs> it really? Let me tell so you. Again, you're going against the government. <laughs> you're looking at 32 years in jail, and we're laughing now. Yeah, yeah I wasn't now, laughing what then. What did the judge say to you? Um, well, we went to the court. It was the day of the trial. We had already gone through jury selection and everything. This was the day it was set to start. And the judge pulls aside and says, listen, um, Mr. Ruiz, you have an offer on the table, and I've never in my years on the bench, 22 years, I think he said, on the bench, um, have seen an offer like this. And he says, because initially I was facing 32 years, then they offered me um, 18 years with 10 years in, eight out. And they said, they're coming to me now. They're going to drop the charges to misdemeanor battery, and it'll be three years probation. So three years probation <laughs> yeah. versus 32 <clears throat> years. Yes. And you were willing to take that chance to, to risk your family, to risk your reputation, to risk almost a life sentence. Why? Faith. <laughs> I, I made a promise. And I said that if, if, if I'm going to stand on it, I'm going to stand on it 100%. I'm going to stand on the faith. I'm going to stand on the truth. And that was one of the biggest parts of it was standing on truth. I wanted people to know that even, even in facing 32 years, that I'm going to risk that to make the truth out there, to bring the truth to light. And that's what I wanted to do. And, and we were able to do that. And, you know, it, it, was, it was a hard decision because as soon as I told the judge no, I mean, we, I went to discuss it with my family. You know, my father, obviously being a pastor, says, mijo, has... You know, as a, as a pastor, I want to tell you, yeah, you're doing the right thing. Stand on your faith. Right. He goes, but I'm your father. And as your father, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm involved with gangs, and I see this day in and out, day in and day out with, with the young Hispanics facing the judicial system. You know, I, I want to tell you to take the plea bargain. So whatever you do, I'm going to back you. You know, but I can't answer you. And you had said, too, that <clears throat> the trial really started when the jury was out. Oh, that's when the trial really was on. And that's the anxiety and Everything. the wondering. So I mean, it's so, it's so thick with tension. Mm -hmm. you, you can, when you walk into the courtroom, you literally feel like if the air is dense. You know, the pressure is in your chest. You feel it. You, you walk in there and you're like, you know, the, the, you know everyone's okay, looking at you. Let me stop you right there. The pressure in your chest, in your chest, that emotion can be transferred to so many different situations that we all face every day. Yes. When you have that pressure in, in your chest and others have that there, what do you suggest that they do? How do they get through that? How did you get through it? How do they get through it? Close your eyes and pray. That's what I did. I, sometimes I would close my eyes and pray. I, don't, I recommend that whoever they, whatever they pray to, whatever, wherever they feel in their heart, close your eyes and get there. Get, get to that point. Um, I think some people refer to it as a Zen area. Some people, depending on, on who you're, on which who you're talking to, you know. Um, but you have to get to that point. You have to relax, breathe, pray, and just and stay positive. You have to stay positive because as hard as it is, they're going to read it. If you look defeated, you will be defeated, and that's how. That's what I think. Really so that's appropriate, that. really, for any situation. For any so. situation at all. Okay. Yeah. So the verdict comes back. <clears throat> well, you're shaking. <laughs> I'm terrified because we're sitting outside and they, they, of course, they announce, they say the verdict's in. And this was two days of deliberation. So, you know, we're at this point, the second day, we're like, man. And then finally they call it. Now it's like my attorney comes up to me and he says to me, now, I hope that you are happy with the job we did. You know, I hope that, you know, we worked for you, we, that you're satisfied with what we did. But because of the fact that we don't know the outcome, we have to ask you to say goodbye to your family. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, we have to, you know, you have to give your ring, your belt, your, everything in your pockets, give it to your wife or to your mom and say goodbye. Because once you're, if you, it's read that you're guilty, you're going to be taken into custody right away. And then um, they'll, it'll be about six months before they figure out where they're going to put you. And then during those six months, you're not going to see anybody. Wow. You know, so. Um, but it came back? Not guilty. Not guilty. When they said not guilty, it was the first time that I can honestly say that I understand now what people, because you know how people say, oh, I was weak in the knees. Right. I had never <laughs> felt that. Even in my wedding, I was strong. I was, right. you know, it was no weakness. You know, right. when they said not guilty, my, my knees get, and I was trying to hold myself up. And my attorneys grabbed me and I was just like, I was so elated. <clears throat> and then shh, the tears came. <laughs> so immediately found out, if I was going to ask you, and I'm the last person that you would have wanted to speak to at that particular point, <laughs> but if I was going to ask you a minute after that, 
what were the real lessons that you learned in order to overcome that, in order to deal with that? What were the real life lessons that you learned that you could pass along to others? Is that you have to stay positive. You have to live it day by day. Don't try to, don't try to control the situation you can't control. Only control what's, what, what you have in front of you. What you can control, that you do. Everything else, let it happen. Stay positive. Keep, keep in contact with good people and surround yourself with good, loving people. A lot of prayer and, 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 be, and just be honorable. And I think that, that you're, you're, you're going to come out okay. I know you'll come out okay. That's what I would tell everybody. You're going to be okay. And in my mind, I even, I even went so far as to say, you know what? If I'm convicted, then obviously God has worked for me in there that he needs me in there for a while. Sure. And that, then that's where, and that was the rationale that I used to say, I'm going to accept this, whether I'm guilty or not guilty. Because whether I'm, if I'm not guilty, then I proved my point and I stood on truth and the truth set me free. If I'm found, if I'm found guilty and I end up in prison, then I'm going to bring some truth in there and help somebody in there. Well, that, that's what I that call was my faith. mindset. <laughs> Kenny, I really, really want to thank you for sharing. I saw you got a little emotional over it, it, there. It is. It is. It, it's. Uh, you know what? It, it it didn't go away. I always thought that I can talk about that situation, but every time I bring up that situation where I had to say bye, it was just it tears at me. Especially because I remember my mother telling me. I'm not leaving without you. I refuse to say bye to you. And she walked away. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, but this is the kind of faith that we had that we said, we're going home today. And we did. Thank you so much for sharing, Thank my friend. You. Thank you so much for sharing.